We are continuing in this series, and we are coming in for a landing. We're in Leviticus chapter 26. There are only 27 chapters, so we can only go so long in this. Um, for those of you that are maybe here for the first time, I just I welcome you, and uh, welcome to one of the strangest series ever taught on a Sunday at a church, because uh, we've been walking through this crazy Old Testament book that's about the rites and rituals and the sacrificial system of the ancient Hebrews. Um, that book, it's really fascinating because what it reveals to us is a God who is not like other gods, who's, who's really creating a people who are not like other people. That's a phrase we've just said through this whole series. And, and through this series, we've been really looking at some things that were written for a specific group of people at a specific time and drawing principles and truth out of those things and applying them to our lives in a place like this. Now, that becomes incredibly challenging when we face something like what we're looking at today. When we come to Leviticus 26, there's some stuff that I think is fairly problematic in our culture. In fact, there's some thinking that is pervasive in our culture, especially around religion and faith and spirituality, that I think gets supported by what we read in Leviticus 26, and yet it's not always a healthy and good sort of way for us to think. And so um, we're going to look at this today. We're going to look at a challenge. We're going to see some things. We're going to extract some principles. We're going to ask some questions about what applies from this to our lives and what doesn't apply to our lives from this. Um, so if you have a Bible, Leviticus chapter 26, we're we're going to start reading in verse 1. We're going to cover the first 13 verses today, and this is what it says. It says, You shall not make idols for yourselves, or erect an image or a pillar, and you shall not set up a figured stone in your land to bow down to it, for I'm the Lord your God. So chapter 26 opens up with God saying, I don't want you to worship idols. Verse 2 says, You shall keep my Sabbaths and reverence my sanctuary. I'm the Lord. So there's this sense of being reverent toward God. Then verse 3 says, if you walk in my statutes and observe my commandments and do them, listen to this, then I will give you your rains in their seasons and the land shall yield its increase and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing shall last to the time of the grape harvest and the grape harvest shall last to the time for sowing and you shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land securely. I will give peace in the land and you shall lie down and none shall make you afraid. And I will remove harmful beasts from the land, and the sword shall not go through your land. You shall chase your enemies. They shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you will chase a hundred. A hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies shall fall before you by the sword. Verse 9 says, I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply you and, you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old store long kept, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I I will walk among you and you and will be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves and I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you to walk upright or erect. So I want you to notice some promises here. If you look at that and you were to break it down, you notice there's a series of promises that God makes to the people of Israel in Leviticus 26. Verse 4, he promises timely rain. He says the rain is going to come just in the right time so that you can grow crops and you can be fruitful. In verse 6, he says you're going to have peace in your land, which was an incredibly important thing for people who were warring against other tribes and people constantly conquering them. He said you're going to have peace. Not only that, you'll have military victory. That's what it says in verse 7. Verse 9, he says... I will increase your number. In other words, there will be babies everywhere, right? So lots of babies. You're going to have lots of babies. Verse 10 is basically this idea of prosperity, that, like this idea that last year's food, you'll still be eating last year's food when you begin to harvest this year's food. You'll have so much food that you'll be getting rid of the old stuff to bring in the new because I'm going to provide for you that sufficiently. Now, I mentioned there's some problems with this, and passages like this, I believe, raise all sorts of questions for us and should raise all sorts of questions for us. In fact, many scholars, many people that study the Bible get a little jumpy and twitchy around passages like this one because it seems to be saying, and it does say, if you do these things, then God will do that. Right? If you do this, then I'll fulfill these promises. And there are people in our world today that use these verses to say, listen, if you follow God, in fact, sometimes we even find ourselves thinking this sort of way, that if you follow God and do what he wants, then God will give you what you want. 
That's sort of the idea, right? You hear this, it's like God says, okay, do this, and I got these promises. So we go, we get this idea from this that, okay, well, if I just follow that through and I do what God wants me to do, then God's gonna do what I want him to do. So my house is gonna get upgraded. My car is gonna get upgraded, right? Things are gonna get a little nicer, right? The Zags are gonna run the table and win all their games, right? Can I get an amen, right? There's things like that. I'm gonna get what I want. There'll be money in the bank and health for my kids and all those sorts of things if I do what God wants me to do, right? Basically, the idea is you win, right? In fact, passages like this one are frequently used to reinforce the idea that our life, like the reason we exist, that our purpose in life is to be comfortable or to experience pleasure. We think that way, right? Our cultural dynamic, our worldview is that we live to be comfortable. We live to have fun. We live to experience pleasure. And we use verses like this to sort of prop up that kind of thinking. Like, life is supposed to go a particular way. And so I can manipulate that way by doing the things that God wants me to do because God ultimately wants comfort and pleasure for me. Here's the problem with this. In fact, I'll let you answer the question. How has this been in your experience? (laughs) It doesn't work this way, does it? Like any of us that have lived any length of time have discovered like it doesn't actually work this way, does it? There's some faulty thinking in this. If we take passages like this and we apply it like that, it breaks down really quickly. All it takes is for things to not go your way for just a moment and you suddenly realize, wait a second, either God's wrong or I'm wrong or there's sort of this miscommunication. So what's happening here? Well, part of what's happening is there's this need for us, whenever we open the Bible, there's this need for us, if we're genuinely going to be true to God's word, then you have to look at all of what the Bible says, not simply lift certain things out that seem to meet our cultural demands. And when you do that, when you take a subject like this one and you look at all of the Bible and you lift all of those things out, suddenly you come across things that seem a little bit more consistent with our experience, right? So like you open up to the book of James in the New Testament. It's a letter written by the half-brother of Jesus. And, and that particular book opens up with James talking about how you and I are refined through trials, through difficulty. And then we go, okay, that makes a little more sense, right? Because I experienced some difficulty. Or, or you look at the life of the apostle. Apostle Paul, and you look at his life, and it's almost contrary to what we see in Leviticus 26, right? If if you've been around the Bible, you've read his story, let me just say this for those of you that aren't familiar, it seems as if every time the Apostle Paul does what God wants him to do, God does the opposite of what any one of us would want him to do for us, right? It's like the more he's obedient, the worse things get. It's like the clue phone's ringing, Paul. Maybe you should just like stop listening and just do your own thing because your circumstances keep getting worse, right? So we see these things, and when you look at it, you realize, well, that means we have to draw a different conclusion about what's going on in Leviticus chapter 26. And this is what we need to understand. And this is something we've been understanding throughout this, that God is speaking to a very specific group of people at a very specific place, a specific time in history, and the way that he is relating in this moment to these people is legitimately this way. He's saying, listen, I am going to bless you, and I'm going to do amazing things in you and through you. I'm going to give you more than you ever imagined you could receive. Why? So that the rest of the world will see that I am a God who is not like other gods, and you are people who aren't like other people. By the way, there are numerous places where God will say things, where he does things, where he promises things that are intended for a specific people at a specific time in a specific place and are not intended to be lifted out and applied wholesale to our lives. It's important to understand that when you look at the Bible. Now, that being said, that doesn't mean that we just close Leviticus 26 and we all go to brunch, right? Because as we've seen through this series, there are still things that do rise out of this that apply to our lives. There are still things specifically that apply to people like us living in a place like this, in a time like this, facing the kinds of things that we face. So for example, one of them, not the one we'll spend at length looking at today, but verse 11 says this. He says, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you. That, that idea of God dwelling among his people, that's something we don't just see in Leviticus 26. That's something we see consistently 
consistently throughout the Old Testament, and then we see that carrying on into the New Testament. We see God saying, I will dwell with you. In fact, we understand that God gives us his spirit, that our bodies, Paul says, are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and that God dwells with us. So there's a principle we lift out of that, and we say, okay, that is true. God does dwell among his people. Or this one, verse 12, which we'll look at at length today, says this. He says, and I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. Again, this is something we're going to see repeated throughout the Bible. It's something we see over and over again. So basically, God says to these people, I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to, I'm going to be with you, and you will be my people. Now, I think this is a particularly interesting picture when you think about this, that, that of all the pictures God could pick, all the imagery that he could use to describe our relationship with him, he uses the imagery of walking together. Now, it's, it's somewhat important for us to understand that back in this day, people walked everywhere. So there was no Uber, there was no Lyft, right? Um, there were no cars or buses or trains. So the walking was the thing. This is the primary mode of transportation which means that when God says, I want you to understand how I'm going to do life with you, he chooses something that is as everyday and as regular as walking. It's just this everyday, regular sort of thing. Now, why does he choose this? What's the big deal about walking? Why is this terminology? Why do we, why is God saying walking? A couple of observations about walking. Um, If you turn to Genesis chapter 5, in Genesis 5, we learn about a guy named Enoch and listen to what it says about this guy's life. It says in verse 24 that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. So Enoch walked with God. In other words, Enoch and God were tight. That's what that means. Enoch walked with God. They were close. They had a friendship. They had a relationship. They were tight, right? Notice in chapter 6 of Genesis, verse 9, the account of Noah. Look at what it says about Noah. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God, right? So Noah walked with God. So walking in the Old Testament is a symbol of a person having a right relationship with God. You and God are walking together. You and God are close. You and God are tight. That's the idea of walking. You walk with God. And if you were close to God, then that means you walked. You did this daily thing with him. Genesis chapter 24, another example of this. Abraham's servant, he's talking to somebody else and he's quoting what Abraham said to him about his own life. And I want you to listen to how Abraham speaks about his life and how he's lived it. Verse 40 of Genesis 24 says, but he said to me, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. So when Abraham is talking about his life, when he's talking about all the question marks that he had come up, the the faith issues where he wondered whether or not God would fulfill his promise, all the circumstances that didn't go the way he expected, Abraham says in the middle of that, the, the phrase that he uses to describe that journey of life and all of its ups and downs is that he walked before the Lord. He sees his whole life, your life is like a walk in the presence of God. Now, to get this, to really understand this, um, I need a volunteer. And my way of volunteering people is usually not asking for volunteers, but just choosing. So I'm going to ask Ryan to come up, if you would, would you? Yeah. <clears throat> just so you guys know, before the service started, Ryan whispered to my ear and he said, the pressure's on, I'm going to sit up front. And so I thought, well, I need a volunteer today. So thank you, Ryan, <laughs> for being my volunteer. He had no idea he was doing this. So, um, so I'm going to ask you to do something I think you're capable of. And uh, I'm going to ask you, would you just walk to the end of the stage over there? And you just observe. Everyone observe, Ryan. Excellent, yes, great. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to step it up a notch. This time on your way back, I want you just to like walk in a circle in the middle of this and then come over to me. Yeah, so you can go anytime. Yeah, like walk over here, like do a circle right in here and then come over here, like a circle now. There you go. Good. The talent. (laughs) The talent, everybody. Can you believe it? Now, one more, one more. This is a little more challenging. I want you to go back in your mind to high school and you're in high school, and there's a hall filled with attractive young ladies, <laughs> and your classroom door is somewhere down there, and you are going to walk in such a way to impress them and make them think highly of you. <laughs> yes. I have a feeling that's what high school was like for you. All right, give Ryan a hand. Give him a hand. So 
so now I want you to notice something. Some observations about Ryan walking. I want you to notice this. When I asked him to walk the first time, did you see Ryan like really stop and think about this? Like, okay, walking. I think that's right foot, left foot, but I'm not sure, but I'm going to try. Okay, right foot, left foot. Like, no, it's just sort of natural, right? He just sort of walks over, he wanders over, everything's nice and easy. Even when I threw him a loop and asked him to go in a circle, right? He was able to do that pretty effortlessly. He wasn't like, okay, make the one foot go more than the other. Like, there wasn't any of that. He just did it, right? And then when we had him, like, show us what he looked like in high school, we just, well, we just, that's what we all expected, those of us that know him, right? So, (laughs) but there's, like, no effort to this, right? You don't think about this. I want you to think about this whole idea. Walking is automatic, right? Walking isn't something that you have to spend time thinking about. In fact, let me give you another example. If right now I yelled fire, there's nobody in the room would be like, all right, right foot, here we go. We got to get out of the building, right? No, immediately I say fire and you guys start moving, right? You start going. You're not thinking about, okay, right foot, left foot, pressure here, pressure there. You just do it. It's this natural sort of everyday thing. It's just a part of the rhythm of life. It's not complicated. It's just how things are. Walking is natural, and when God chooses a word to describe our relationship with him, he says, I just want to walk with you, like effortlessly, like every day, just sort of through the rhythms of life. It's a normal thing. It's a natural thing, which isn't how we always think, right? Sometimes we think so differently. In fact, um, every now and then, you know, I'll talk to somebody, and this has happened over the years. You talk to somebody who's dating somebody new. Have you ever noticed, like, when somebody's just beginning to date someone, they're in what I call the rainbows and unicorn stage, right? Where it's like, well, tell me about a time you guys have had some sort of conflict. And like, conflict? We never have conflict. Like, tell me about this person. They just gush all good stuff, right? You're like, tell me, like, a bad trait. There are no bad traits. I think it's like I'm, you know, dating the most perfect person since Jesus, right? Like, we kind of do that. We sort of do those things. Well, I've had those conversations with people when they're just starting to date and they're in the rainbows and unicorns thing, and I'll ask the question. I'll say, well, where is that person? Like, where is that guy? Where is he spiritually? Like, what's, what's going on with he and God? And so many times in my life, and maybe you've seen this or maybe you've been there, people will look at me and they'll say, well, we haven't really talked about that yet. I'm always kind of like, well, why? Well, the reason why is that for us, that's not natural, right? Because we have our life and we think, oh man, that guy or that gal, they're great at this and they're great at that and they're sort of moving through life and we talk about all the stuff they're walking through, but God isn't a part of that. God's this other category over here and we don't necessarily get into that stuff so we haven't gotten there yet. That doesn't, like we'll talk about that, but that's this other thing over here and we sort of separate, don't we? The same thing happens when you start thinking through, well, what does it look like to be a doctor and a Jesus follower? And we talk about how we live that out, how to be a business owner and a Jesus follower, or how to be a teacher and a Jesus, or a mom, or a dad and a Jesus follower. You start asking those questions and people start thinking to themselves, what does being a Jesus follower have to do with my job? It has everything to do with your job because the illustration God uses for our relationship with him is a walk. It means he's with you in all of those moments in the everyday regular rhythms of life. God is moving through life with you. So there's this thinking out there. There's this idea that's pervasive in our culture that there's life and then there's God, and yet God uses imagery that contradicts that completely. Walking is natural, and so should be God's involvement in our lives. Walking is an integral part of our existence. Walking is just what we do. And that's what God's saying. There is this natural rhythm, and I want you to do life with me. That's what this is about. Now, here's another idea. When it came to the little freestyle portion there where Ryan got to show us what he was like in high school, do all of us have, if all of us got the opportunity, which I know all of you would like the opportunity to do what he did, right? It'd be great. If all of us had that opportunity and all of us said, hey, show me what you walked like when you were in high school in this situation, would all of us do the exact same thing? No, we wouldn't. In fact, the guy that did that in the first service, he had quite the strut. It was like straight up John Travolta strut. Of course, he's like a 70s guy. So, 
Um, but we do, we do our own thing, right? So you think about this idea. God says, I'm going to walk with you. Well, what's distinct about us is our walk, right? None of us walk the same. We all walk differently. We all have our own walk. We all have our own style. Maybe that's because God creates us as individuals. And maybe your walk with God isn't going to look like somebody else's walk with God. If God is walking with you in your life, that means the gifts he's given you and the passions he's given you and the talents, the circumstances, the relationships, the career, all of those things, that is your walk and God is walking with you in that and it isn't like anybody else's. God didn't make you like the person sitting next to you for a reason. Your walk is your walk, and you are walking your life. You're living your life with him. He's in, integrated a part of your life. There's this idea that somehow when we start living life with God, well, I should make my life look like this. Like, I'm supposed to be doing what that person does. I'm supposed to pray this way, read this thing, do these sorts of things, because that's what that person who I admire looks like. We find ourselves shoving ourselves into this homogenous idea of what it looks like to walk with God and yet it goes against what God has created us to be, and that's who we are. How do you and I walk with God? We do it, we do it in a way that is unique to us. We do it in a way that is only us. And if you live in a place or you find yourself at times either wrestling with the pressure of people saying, you know, you're supposed to walk it like this, or your life's supposed to look like that, let me just say, that would be a very boring world if all of our walks were exactly the same. Amen? So God says, I want you to walk with me in the way that you live your life. I want to walk this journey that you're in. Now, one more thought, final thought here. Um, I'm a fast walker, not like an Olympic fast walker. I don't put on the tights and do that thing. I'm just a fast walker. My wife walks fast. Um, we walk fast everywhere we go. Like, we're always walking fast. In fact, sometimes we just have to slow down, but like naturally, we just walk like very fast people. And then um, I know people who are not fast walkers. They are saunterers. You know people like this? Like the French word saunter means sans tier, which is basically um, no destination. That's what that means. <laughs> Truly, that's, what the, that's the, the, how the words derive. So like you, you know people that walk this way, right? They like walk and it's like, are you really going anywhere? Like, you know, sometimes, especially if you're a fast walker, you're walking with that person. It's like, is this, are we going to get to where we're going? Because you're sort of wandering along. If I make the decision to go walk with a saunterer, then somebody has to make a decision about the speed or the pace, right? I have to make a decision. Are we going to walk my pace and the saunterer is going to have to walk with me or am I going to walk their pace and adjust myself to them? If you're going to walk with someone else, somebody has to adjust their pace. And when God says, I want you to walk with me, it means that somebody is going to be adjusting their pace, who do you think that person is? <laughs> right? We don't ask God, hey God, you know what? Um, I'd like to move a little quickly here. Like, can we move through this season of life? Can we move through this circumstance? God, can we pick it up? No, we don't do that, right? Or we say, God, you know what? I think you're moving a little, a little too quickly for me. I'm a little uncomfortable with this pace. No, no, we don't do that. We walk with God. God is the one that sets the pace, which means there are times when it's going to feel a little uncomfortable because he's moving a little faster than we'd like. And there are times it's going to be uncomfortable because he's moving a little more slowly than we'd like. But the point is that you and I are adjusting to walk with him. Last week, um, we surprised our girls on Christmas morning, and um, it was just a great surprise. We planned a trip um, to New York City uh, to go visit friends. We used to live there 10 years ago. We moved back to Spokane, and, uh, and so we, we surprised our girls Christmas morning, which was kind of a fun thing to do. They thought they were having the worst Christmas ever until they found out what was happening, which I loved watching them fake uh, like they really liked the gifts we gave them. It was awesome. Like, the, like thanks guys for the travel pillow. Like, like, great, we don't go anywhere. But anyways, so, so we surprised our girls with this trip. It was just like this really exciting thing. We held, held it a secret for like two months. It was a really awesome thing. But there was one problem, right? Like a couple of weeks before we went on our trip, uh, my youngest daughter, Meg, she was ice skating and she broke her ankle. And at first we thought it was a sprain, and then we're like, oh no, it's definitely broken. And then there's like this whole thing where in the back of our minds, we're like, how in the world do you go to New York with a broken ankle, right? This is, this is going to be a very unfun surprise for Christmas, um, which, by the way, she was the one of our three daughters that said to us, I'm not really into surprises. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just kind of funny. But we had, this, we had this struggle, right? So if you've been to New York or not, you know there's lots of stairs and there's lots of just walking around. There's lots of crowds, especially the time of year that we went. And so it wasn't exactly the most ideal thing. And then there was this one particular moment, like 
early on in the trip where we sort of had this realization of somebody's going to have to change their pace here. Somebody's going to have to walk at another person's speed. We were coming out of a subway tunnel, particularly deep station, and there's long escalators that get us out of the station. My daughter had not been on an escalator yet with her crutches, and she was not about to. And so she made this decision. (laughs) Step by step by step. Did I mention that I'm a fast walker? (laughs) I didn't take this picture because I thought it was cute. I took this picture because I was bored. I was like, well, okay, I guess I'll take a picture, you know. (laughs) Find something to do along this journey, right? So I had to make this adjustment, right? And the whole time, we just kept having to adjust. Like, you know, we'd charge on ahead, and then we'd look back, and like, she's back in the crowd. We're like, in fact, we started calling her clickety-clack, because we would just listen for the clickety-clack of her crutches behind us, you know? And so, um, which was better than her old nickname, which was Peg Leg. And so, um, <laughs> so we'd wait for her, you know, it was this constant thing. And there's this moment, you know, there's kind of this moment for you, and I, I don't know if you have this where, you know, like, things are really amazing. Like, you're going to surprise your kids for Christmas, and your daughter gets a broken ankle. Um, sometimes things like this happen, right? Sometimes... Um, you know, you've got plans for a picnic and there's this single dark cloud that seems to drift over your picnic in rain. Um, Sometimes there's a trajectory that your life is going and suddenly that trajectory changes, right? There's a direction you thought things were going to move and and it's suddenly not going the way. There are times when, like, amidst all of the good that's going on, amidst all of the walking that we're doing, that we seem to stumble. There seems to be a pothole that we step in. There's something we trip over. There's this thing that comes up in our life, which really raises a different set of questions, doesn't it? Like when things don't go the way that we expect them to go. You know what I'm talking about, right? This stuff happens to all of us. James chapter 1. I mentioned it earlier, but James is this interesting letter that's found in the New Testament. I say it's interesting because James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes a letter and he starts a a letter in a way that is not popular. It's not popular in our culture. I don't believe it was popular in his culture. I don't think this was a letter that people got back then and said, oh man, this is such a feel-good thing. I love this guy, James. I think James started this and it was as hard for the first people that read it as it is for us to read it, but I think it challenges our understanding of the lives that we're living and the things that we walk through in our life. Listen to this. James chapter 1, verse 2 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So count it all joy when, when you face these things. I think it's incredibly important for us to understand that in James's framework of, of the world, his understanding of the life that you and I are living, the walk that we have, it is not an issue of if trials come into your life. It's when you approach trials. It's when. It's not, hey, you might be one of those unlucky people who encounter this thing. It is most of you are going, to, like, it's not, it's not even most of, it's all of you. All of you are going to encounter trials of many kinds. In fact, he's talking, he's saying, listen, whenever this comes up, like whenever, because it's going to come up, whenever this comes up, the mood is that you are going to experience trials. Or how about this one? In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is preaching the Sermon on the Mount, which is this three-chapter beautiful sermon on what it looks like to follow him and to live this life that, that he's called us to. It's this, it's this sermon that talks about love and forgiveness and grace. It talks about lust and greed. and I mean, like, you name the category. It talks about finding life beyond the physical that we can touch and feel and see around us. It's this beautiful sermon, right, that he, that he preaches. But then at the very end of it, listen to how he closes this thing. Matthew chapter 7 verse 24 says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. He's wrapping up his sermon and he says, listen, I want you to understand something about what I've said. Listen, the, and he doesn't say, listen, the rains might come if you're one of those people who never gets a break, he says the rains came down. Like, if you listen to what I'm talking about, if you listen to this life I'm offering, then, then there's this thing, like the rains are going to come and they're going to pound against your house. It's sort of a matter-of-factness to what Jesus is saying here. It's going to rain. And if you want to find out if somebody really gets 
what I'm talking about. If you want to find out if somebody really understands the God life, if you want to know if somebody's really, really seeing all that I'm talking about, if you want to see that, then you'll see that when the rain's falling, not when the sun's shining. That's when you know that you get it. That's when you discover the person that you're made of, the trials and the rains and the storms. They're a part of life. I just tell you, like, when we walk in the streets of New York, which we eventually got my daughter onto an escalator, which just made things a lot better for all of us. But can I just say, like, I got to see what my daughter was made of as she just step after step after step. And I thought, man, this kid is stubborn, <laughs> right? No wonder we have this life with her, right? She's a strong kid. There's another story that I think brings perspective to some of this. In Mark chapter 4, Jesus is teaching this long day of teaching, and at the end of it, he gets his disciples into a boat, and they're going to get away from the crowds, and I want you to listen to this. It says, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling but he, speaking of Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, which I think is a very interesting detail, right? It's not just that Jesus was asleep. He was asleep on a cushion. You sort of get this picture of Jesus very comfortable taking a nap at the front of the boat, right? But there's a point here. The storm is kicking up. Is Jesus concerned about the storm? He's not, is he? The storm to Jesus is really not that big of a deal. But notice the disciples' response to this. Verse 38, And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? So Jesus is sleeping, obviously unaware, uncaring about this storm, and the disciples in the middle of this, they see it completely differently. Our lives are about to end. This thing's about to go down in this boat, right? right do you not care, Jesus, that we're perishing? So verse 39 says, He awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So there's this storm and the disciples are freaking out and they're wondering, is this the end? And then Jesus gives some orders and the storm is done. But what does this tell us? Here's what it tells us. Apparently the storms that look one way to us look different to him. Apparently when the storm is so threatening that we would venture to wake up Jesus from a nap, right? Something so frightening that we're like going to mess with somebody when they're sleeping, which everyone knows you just don't do. Even when the storms of life, when the storms have pressed us to the limit, it's, it's basically revealing that something that looks one way to us might look very different to God. Do we understand that? Can we conceive of it? No. In the moment, we're caught with the emotion, right? We're caught up in all the fear. We're caught up in all the things that are going on around us. But the point of the story is that Jesus just sees this thing differently than we see it. It doesn't reduce our panic necessarily, but it does absolutely increase our trust in him. He sees this differently than we see it. There's something that happens when you and I walk with God through certain storms. There's something that takes place when in the middle of the storm we find ourselves walking with God. There's something about encountering those storms when you live life with him. There's this passage in Isaiah that I, I think speaks just so beautifully of the Father's heart towards his people towards us. And in Isaiah chapter 46, verse 3, there's just this beautiful image. God says, listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb. Even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. Like even when you have gray hair on your head, I will be carrying you. I have made, and I will bear, and I will carry, and I will save as a dad, for me, there are these moments in my life when, when I find myself kind of knowing the way and I know my children along for the ride may not know what's ahead. They may not know the destination. They may not know the route. They may not have security that I have all the answers. But there is this thing for me that says, as a dad, I get very protective. I'm very vigilant. I know there's this thing that says, no matter what, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that my daughters get where they need to go. I'm always going to get us through. I'm going to do everything that I could possibly do to get my daughters to the destination. Are there times when we don't know the destination? There are, aren't there? Aren't there times? I mean, there's times that we just, we don't know where we're headed. There, there are times we, I don't know if I could, I, like God, I don't know if I can go on. I don't know if I can keep doing this thing. I don't know if I, I don't know if I can keep seeing it the way you see it. 
Are there times when, like, the disciples, we cry out and we just say, do you not care? Do you not see me? Like, God, do you not see us, like, perishing here? Do you not understand how desperate this situation is? You know what I love about all of this? None of this shames us for asking these questions. None of this shames us for crying out to God and saying, God, do you see me here? I think there's this tendency to think, like, you're not allowed, like, if you're going to be strong in your faith, you're not allowed to cry out to God. Like, you just got to be strong and trust and have faith. No, the, the best examples in Scripture are people saying, God, I don't know if you're here. I don't know if you see me. I don't know if you care. I'm wondering whether or not you even see what's going on around me. Then there's this theme you see about crying, about crying out in the Bible. In the Psalms particularly, I want to show you several things. Psalm chapter 6, verse 9. You want to think about whether or not God wants you to cry out or not. Listen to this. Psalm chapter 6, verse 9 says, The Lord has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord accepts my prayer. Idea number one is that when you cry out, when you actually just say, God, I don't know what's going on, he hears you. Turn over to chapter 9, verse 12. It says, For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. If idea number one is that God hears you, then idea number two is when you're afflicted and you're in distress, God isn't ignoring you. He might be moving at a different pace, but he's not ignoring you. Notice chapter 10, verse 17 says, O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart and you will incline their ear. He hears you. He's not ignoring you. And he even gives you strength in the middle of the mess. Psalm 34, verse 17 When people lose it, when people cry out, when people admit they don't have it all together, it says, verse 17, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to who? Look at this. He's near to the brokenhearted. We don't even have a construct for this in our culture, right? But God's near to those that are brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. It doesn't say he does it immediately. It doesn't say he does it at our pace, but it does say that he is near to those who are broken. It's in our brokenness. God's there with us. It's in, our, it's in our state of crushed spirit that God is rescuing us. He's meeting us in this. God says, when we cry out, I hear you. I don't ignore you. I strengthen you. I'm there with you. I'm rescuing you. I will deliver you. That's what he's saying. This last, this last trip to New York, um, it wasn't the first time that I had to navigate New York with my youngest daughter with a broken leg. Um, in fact, when we moved to New York City years ago, she had a broken leg, and um, it happened just days before we actually moved. I was loading our moving truck, and as I was loading it, um, just carrying things from our house and moving into, into there, I hear this scream from one of my daughters. My oldest daughter is screaming, and she's screaming about her sister, and so as fast as a dad can possibly move, I ran out of the truck, and I ran around. We lived on a corner, quiet street on the South Hill, and I ran around the corner, and as I rounded the corner, I saw my daughter laying in the middle of the street, and I saw a car with a person getting out of it to check what they'd run over. And, I, and I'll just never forget, I'm um, just running to her and, and just scooping her up. I did what you're never supposed to do, right? I just scooped her up, and I grabbed her in my arms. I wasn't thinking about stabilizing her neck or protocols, right? Because that's not what dads do when they see their children in this state. So I just scooped her up in my arms, and I remember there was so much blood, I didn't know what, what the front was or the back was of her. But as I picked her up and I got her to my chest, she started screaming. And so I was just like, oh, man, she's at least breathing, you know, so she's screaming. And, and, uh, and so the more she screams, I'm like running her back to the house, and the more she screams, the, the more I'm just saying, hey, baby, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. You're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And I just kept saying that over and over to her. You're going to be all right. You, we got this. You're all right. You're all right. And I brought her in the house, and I laid her on the floor, and she had a tire track across her chest, and she had a broken leg and this laceration across her head, and, uh, and she was complaining about her pinky, um, which seemed ironic given all that was going on in that moment. <laughs> Fire trucks showed up, and, you know, paramedics came and they immediately cut off you know her little shorts and her shirt and whole thing you know just this nightmarish thing I just kept saying you're going to be all right all right you got we got this we got this I just kept whispering I just kept saying that over and over set it all the way down to the hospital following the ambulance I just kept saying you're going to be all right You're, you're going to be okay and and she was obviously you saw a picture of her and her stubbornness still walking upstairs but can I just tell you that that's what God does for us in the middle of our crisis, when we walk with him, he lifts us up in the middle of all the chaos, in the middle of all the mess, 
in the middle of all the blood and everything, God just whispers in our ear, saying, listen, we got this. We're gonna get through this. There's more going on than what we see in front of us. There is more to this than what you see right here. He scoops us up. And what God desires is for people who will just cry out to him. People who will say, God, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to get through this. I don't even know what to say about this. I have no way to reconcile this. But God, would you just lift me up? And he does that. He does it. It doesn't always feel good. But imagine this. Imagine, imagine years later, my daughter and I end up in therapy together. It could very well happen based on our life together. But um, imagine we end up in therapy together and there's this repressed memory that suddenly comes out, right, about this day. Can you imagine if my daughter looked at me and she said, Dad, you are the most irresponsible father ever. I cannot believe you didn't, like, stabilize my neck and keep me there in the street. The fact that you scooped me up that way and whispered in my ear, what were you thinking, right? You should have held me there. You should have made sure I was safe. And you could have easily kept those paramedics from cutting my clothes and doing those things. Like, like can you imagine if my daughter said that to me? I'd be devastated, right? Because ironically and strangely, one of the most intimate moments of rescue for me as a father is one of the bloodiest, worst moments, right? For me as a dad, one of the most intimate moments for me as a dad is me rescuing in the middle of this mess and holding her to my chest. And my daughter saying to me, yeah, that was whole, you did that thing wrong. <laughs> Would sort of wreck things, wouldn't it? And yeah, I think there's this tendency sometimes when God's in the middle of scooping us up, we're like, God, you're not doing this the way I want you to but it's just the arms of a loving father who's picking us up and he's holding us and he's saying, listen, I know this is rough and I know this isn't easy, but I got you and we got this. We got this. I think the question is, what do we need to cry out to God for? There's this value in our culture that says, I gotta white knuckle it, I gotta just do this thing. Only weak people need God. And yet God says, I value just the opposite. I value people who are just willing to let me reach down and pick them up. I value people who in angst cry out to me and say, I don't understand. I want people to wake me up in the bow of the boat and say, I'm perishing. Do you not see what's happening here? I want to show you what I see. I want to, I want to, to give you the love that I have for you. That's what he's saying. And so what do we need to cry out for? What's the stuff we're holding on to? What's, what's the stuff that you're, you're just like fighting it, you're wrestling and you're just going, no, I got this, I got this, I got this. And you're white knuckling it. And you just need to say, God, I don't understand this. What are the questions you have and you're afraid to ask them because you're afraid you're going to offend God? Can I just say you're not going to offend him? All the stories, everything we hear, people are crying out consistently saying, God, I don't get it. You're not going to ruin his reputation by saying, I don't understand, but I'm going to let him rescue. For you to say, God, I need your peace, I need your hope, I need your joy in a time I can't imagine having it, that's what he's inviting us to. He says, I want to walk with you. I want to be a part of this life with you. This messy up and down mountaintops and valleys life. I want to be in this with you. I'm looking for people who will cry out. Amen. Would you stand with me? May you be men and women who walk with God in the ups and the downs, and may you be unafraid to cry out to him. And most of all, may you experience his rescue. May you experience his arms lifting you up and embracing, and may you hear the whisper of his voice in your ear. We got this. We're going to get through this. Amen? Amen? Love you guys so much. Thanks for being here, and we'll see you guys, see you guys later. See you.